Last week, my wife and I celebrated our 16th wedding anniversary. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, I, was, I was married when I was three years old, and uh, it's been a good... No, uh, it's, been, it's been a really wonderful 16 years, and it was cool looking back at some pictures this past week of, of uh, that day when we got married. And uh, you know when you look at a picture of yourself from that long ago, and you're like, ugh, you know, like, that's like a different human being. And I looked at those kids, and they had no idea what they were signing up for. They had no clue. Anybody with me on that? You're like, yes. Some of you 16, some of you 20, some of you 40, 50 years in, you're like, the day we got married, we had no idea what love was. We didn't know what marriage meant. Um, if you're new on the journey of marriage, hey, strap in, buddy, ma'am, it's going to be a blast. Um, but the thing is, uh, it was a day of beginnings. It was a day of first starts. And as I looked at those pictures, I, I, I realized that we, at that day, we hadn't even had our kids yet. We'd never bought a house together yet. We hadn't had uh, so many of the really wonderful moments that we'd had yet. We also hadn't had any of the rough times, you know, where we were like, man, is this, whew, are we even doing this right? You know what I mean? Looking back and celebrating beginnings is, is fun. And, and as I think about that, it really gets us started well for this week because uh, I think beginnings are a big part of our life. It's arguable that without beginnings and ends, uh, you're really not alive. I mean, like biologically speaking, you got to be born, you got to die. And if you don't do that, you are a, I don't know, a rock. And I think even them, they come from somewhere. So uh, I'm not a rock scientist. I don't know. But the beginnings of something indicate about you that you're alive. But it also indicates about you that there's still stuff yet to come. And so whether for you it's been, you know, first days of school or your, your first kids or your kid's first tooth getting lost or maybe your first kid moving out of the house, your first grandchild. I mean, it goes on and on. Beginnings upon a beginnings upon a beginnings. And here's the thing. God is big on beginnings. He really is. It's one of his favorite things. In fact, he kind of, he kind of came up with the idea of beginnings. We are talking today, we're starting a teaching series, a five-week teaching series that I'm calling Let's Open the Bible. And it's something I've been looking forward to for months. I am so excited about this teaching series. Here's the deal. In five weeks, we're going to go through the entire Bible, starting today. Woo! So we'll be leaving here at 6 o'clock tonight. And no, it's going to be a little installments. And it's going to be broken up because the goal is to take kind of a 10,000-foot view of the Bible. Uh, maybe you've never read the Bible, cover to cover or at all. If that's you, you're in good company. There's been some research done. Uh, the Lifeway Christian Research Group back in 2017 did a third survey. I think this was of about 2,000 people. And these were all Americans. And they found that of the 2,000 people, uh, about 11% had read the entire Bible. That's actually, I was impressed. That's pretty big. An additional 9% say they had read it more than once. Um, so that's pretty awesome. That's about 20%, one out of every five people who have read the whole Bible. But then you keep reading the statistics. And it's over 50%, and I believe that, I don't know for sure, but I think these were Christians, but even it's just, we're a Christianized nation. Over 50%, I think it was 53% of those surveyed had barely cracked it. Didn't know it was inside, hadn't really read it. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting to see because did you know the Bible is like the all-time world best-selling book and it's been produced in more languages than anything else and all these amazing statistics. Many of us have multiple copies and multiple trans, uh, you know, versions of the Bible in our house but we don't read it. We just don't. It's just there, and it's like, you know, it's a family heirloom or something. Um, in another study done by the Center for Biblical Engagement, they surveyed 200,000 people around the world. So lots of different cultures, lots of different religious backgrounds, lots of different stuff like that. And they found four key discoveries that I think are pretty amazing. And these are some things that I think can be an anchor this morning as we jump in and say, this might be worth doing, reading the Bible together. Listen to this. Among those surveyed, for people who engage their Bibles at least four times a week, they are 228% more likely to share their faith with others. I, I thought you only get 100%, but this is even better. 228%. That's, that's really good. So engaging in Scripture four times a week makes you more apt and more ready and more excited about sharing your faith. Uh, here's Check this one out. 407% more likely to memorize Scripture. That's like even better than 200%, I think. Like, I'm, that's pretty amazing. These next two, though, are pivotal, and I think that are, are going to touch us like in, in, in the core of who we are. Check this out. Uh, those who engage their Bibles four times a week, 59% less likely to view pornography, 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness, 
And those two specific statistics rise to the top because those are two of the biggest struggles that people have, especially in our culture. And then you can continue. There's more that you can read about it. Back to the Bible.org slash research. If you want that link later, come get me. Um, but here's what we found, that engaging with the Bible on a regular basis apparently has some tangible, measurable benefits in your life, like just getting into the Bible. But this is the coolest part. The Bible is not just chicken soup for the soul. You remember those books? It's not just a good book that's good for your life. It's not just a life for dummies book. It is more than that. I've come up with this kind of working definition that I'm going to be developing and working on throughout this series, that this is what the Bible is. The Bible is the powerful story of God's mission to partner with mankind in putting the world back together in light of evil on the earth. And I hope to say that every week or some form of it, that God has this recognition that there's evil in the world and that he has decided to come alongside us to help put it back together. That he's given us purpose, he's given us mission. And what that also implies is that he puts our lives back together. That's what the Bible is. And so, yes, there are some tangible, measurable benefits of reading the Bible, but it's also this story from the creator of the universe, the supreme power of all things. And so today, as we get started in this five-week teaching through the Bible, we want to start with a simple word, beginnings, beginnings. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and flip over to the very first book, first chapter, first verse of the Bible, Genesis. The word Genesis means beginnings. It's the first book in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you today, I highly encourage you to grab the YouVersion Bible app off your app store. It's a really good uh, app to read through the Bible. They've got reading plans. I'm going to talk about that a little later, about how you can plug into the Bible. Also, we've got free hardback or paperback Bibles that we give away here at this shelf by the door. Everyone in our church should have a Bible that's readable, and this is your challenge. I want to see all of us. I'm going to do it too. Bring your physical Bible to church for this whole series. You can do it. Don't rely on technology because you also have Instagram on that and your email and your cell phone. This is like an extra step to go, this is just for me to encounter God. This is all this is for. I'm going to do that. And so I'm going to challenge you. Do that. If you need one of these, we got some. I mean, we might have to buy new Bibles after today because you might be like, you know what? I know they say there's free Bibles every week at church, but I've never taken one because that's for somebody else. No, it's for you. It's for everyone in this room. Take one. All right. Bibles. Uh, as, you, as you kind of look up Genesis, I want to kind of give us a background on where this book came from, the Bible. Where did it come from? Um, now, the book that we know as the Bible is kind of a misnomer because it's not really a book. It's more like a library. Inside of this one binding, there are 66 books, and each of them has kind of different genre, different authors, different settings, different uh, context that they were written into. Uh, there's two basic divisions, and the first basically two-thirds or more is the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the story of, of uh, God creating the world. We see the introduction of sin into the world, and we see God's plan to select a group of people. It becomes the nation of Israel, and to, through that group of people, share his plan to partner with them to put the world back together. That's what the Old Testament's about in, in a nutshell. And and then when you get uh, to, uh, oh, let's take a couple other things about the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew initially, and so the versions we have today have been translated from that. Uh, but the, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, they were meticulous about recording things down. Every several generations, a leader would rise up, they would be inspired to write down what had happened either in their generation or the generations before, and it was the story of their people. Most importantly, the story of how God was interacting with their people. And so that's what they wrote down. And so, uh, you know, the Bible grew as years went by. And it became, they didn't, they, they, they had initial books, the first five books, which were kind of pulled together by Moses that became their law and the way that they built their culture. But as the rest of it progresses, uh, you get some more stuff there. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second too. The last little third or less of the Bible we call the New Testament. Uh, Testament is a word that means covenant. And so this is God's new covenant, God's new promise with mankind. The old covenant was what you find in the Old Testament. The new covenant involves Jesus. And at the beginning of the New Testament, and this was about 2,000 years ago, we see Jesus born. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas, along with movies and presents. But the thing that, that Christianity kind of puts at Christmas time is the Jesus story. And then so in the New Testament, we get Jesus being born, we get his ministry, uh, about three decades of that, and then we get the start of the church. And that's what the New Testament is. And so we're going to get into that in a couple of weeks. Uh, now, here's the deal. You could get a PhD in understanding where the Bible came from and all the background of all of it. We're not handling all that today. Thank goodness, because nobody wants to do that today. But if you want some resources on that, first of all, we spent an entire class period talking about it in our Venture Basics class, which we offer a couple times a year. If you'd like that material, I'd be glad to just send it to you. Uh, it's in a document, and it's on Google Docs, and you can read it yourself. I've got books that you can look at, because 
accepting this and saying this is the inspired word of God is a big leap for a lot of people. Um, because, wow, this is a really old book, and how could we even have any assurance? I will tell you that it is because of my personal conviction looking at evidence and, and, and logic and a lot of other things that I've decided, yes, I want to base my life on this book. But it'd be silly for me to just say, you should do it because I said so. Uh, it's out there. I would encourage you to jump into it. Um, the goal of this series is to take that 10,000-foot view, to start in Genesis, work our way all the way to Revelation. And so today we dive into beginnings. I'm going to be in Genesis, and um, the first 12 chapters of this book is packed with information about who God is and how he interacts with us, and we're just going to start at the very first word, and we're going to read a good chunk of Genesis 1-1, and so without any further ado, let's jump in. Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. There are a lot of theories on where the earth came from, and you can get into all that. That's not what this series is about either. The Bible makes the claim that, Jesus, that God created, that in the beginning, God created. And it's from that position that the rest of this entire book and eventually the foundation of the Christian faith is born. And so that's something to really dive into. The thing to understand about this is that God exists outside of our time and our space. He would have to, to create you, you can't play with Plato if you are Plato. But if you were outside of Plato and you were a kid, you can. And so that's where God comes in and he creates. Uh, let's just keep going, starting in verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, this basic formula continues as he continues to create for six more days. And uh, in verses 6 through 8, he separates the water and the sky. And then in verses 9 through 10, he causes the water to gather in, in seas and pools and rivers and lakes so that there can be dry land. And so now that there's dry land, uh, in verses 11 through 13, he causes plants and vegetation to grow. And then in verses 14 through 19, we see him go to the celestial beings and he creates stars and, and, and the sun and moon and all that kind of stuff going on in the heavens. And then in verse 20, we see him begin to create light. Life outside of plants and vegetation. So he creates sea life and he causes the waters to just teem with creatures. Verse 24, we see him fill the land with animals and birds. And in each moment after he creates, and the Bible lays it out as, a, as days, and he says, and this was the end of this day. And then God says, and it was good. And it was good. And that is good. And that is good. And then in verse 26, God arrives at the moment he'd been working toward. And he says in verse 26, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And on this first birthday of mankind, humanity, did you see that? We got made. Verse 31, it says that God saw that what he had made. God saw what he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. The message here is clear. The Bible says that God created all of it, everything that we see, and that the crowning jewel of his creation was mankind. It was us. And as he looked at all the things he could make, he said, this is the thing I want to make in my image. And after everything was done, he does something bizarre. This is this out, verse 20, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he'd been doing. So that on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is bizarre for me because I'm looking at God and he just had all this infinite ability to create. And then what? He needs a break? Like, is he tired? 
Is he run, did he run out of things to do? Um, after, man, just after being really taught about this a lot and reading a lot on it, um, th- this is something interesting. That it's, it's none of that. It's that when God created, he looked at it and he said, this is good. And what he said was, this is enough. When you look at what God is trying to teach mankind throughout the entire Bible, there are a handful of things that you could say. This is a summary of, of God's goal for us. One of them seems to be this. God wants us to be a creation that knows when enough is enough. Like, you know, one of the biggest things that Christianity calls us to is self-control. <laughs> like, you need to know, like, I've had enough pizza. I've had enough cake. I've had enough extracurricular. Like, I've, I've had enough. That we could step back, and here's the key. He takes the seventh day, and the Jewish people begin, uh, th- their, their whole, you know, calendar it gets based off of the seven-day thing, and they, they take six days to work, and then they take one day, and they call it Sabbath rest. And this idea of Sabbath is, is very simple. You simply stop. It's a ceasing of work. Because in this ceasing, you get to sit back and emulate what God does, and you get to say, it, it is enough. But more than that, you say, you know what? I trust the Creator so that I don't have to work seven days a week to put bread on the table. God's gonna provide for me. I don't have to work seven days a week to make sure the ends meet and to make sure that everything's done all the time. In the Jewish uh, culture, it's the more uh, rigorous followers of this would even make specific rules. They kind of put fences around the different rules to make sure they didn't get anywhere close to breaking God's, God's uh, expectations. And they would go as far as like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like walk a certain distance, I'm not gonna go a certain thing. But the purpose of this is for us as people to be able to step back and go, God, can provide. I can take some time to stop and trust God to provide. You want a challenge? We're, we're, you know, not at the challenge at the end of the sermon yet today, but here's a challenge for you. A lot of you have yesterday, tomorrow, a lot of you have tomorrow off for Labor Day. Here's a challenge. Trust God with that day. Take some time to worship. Take some time to just stop doing and just be. See what God will do with you in that time. It's an amazing thing. And if you begin to make it a habit to take time with family for worship, not just an hour or so on Sunday morning, but if you could do a whole day where you're like, I'm, I have enough. I'm going to trust God with this. More importantly, uh, as we read through the Bible, not more importantly, but something that's really important as we look, look through the Bible is, is this idea. This, if you look at this thing we just read, as Western thinking Americans, one of the big things we try to do is we look at this like a, a recipe for creating a planet. Like, you know how you, you create a planet in six days? That's how you do it. And first, you want to start with light, of course, and then you want to do the. Um, that's not what this is. Uh, when, when the original writers, uh, readers would have read this, they come from an Eastern background. And so whereas we're concerned more about the, the time and the length and the, all this thing, I want to tell you this. If God wanted to, he could have created it with a snap of a finger and it's all done. But he did it in phases. And I think more than trying to teach us the recipe for building a planet, I think he was trying to do something else. Uh, In this culture, and it's still Eastern thinking, is still a major big thing today. It's, It's not so much about the details and the rigorous stress of the logic behind it, but the story behind it, the imagery, the pictures that are going on. And so in this setting, what are we seeing in this? What's the big picture? Uh, you could debate for days on was this a literal seven-day creation, or what six-day creation, was it this, was it that? Uh, have fun with that. But I don't think that was God's goal for leaving us this message. I don't think it was his goal to get in fight with people who think it took longer to make the earth or not. I read what it says, and I trust that God could do anything he wanted to have done. But I think the bigger message of this is this. I, I wrote down four things that I drew away. One, God wants us to know the treasure that I created all this. That's what God wanted us to know. I made this. That's the first treasure. The second thing that I found out of this is that God created mankind in his image. He wanted us to know, you're special to me. There's a lot of things in this world, but you are special to me. And that's going to play into this picture of God putting the world back together majorly. He's not putting back the world with, together with horses and giraffes and, and raccoons. Like that's, Those are not his chosen vehicles. He has chosen humans. We're important to him. The third thing I drew out of this was that God... Uh, created the world, what's the rest of this for? As a gift to us, to provide for us and for us to manage. That's the instructions he gave Adam and Eve, take care of this. And the fourth thing I drew out of this is that God wants us to know when enough is enough. I don't know that God cares if we chase the American dream. I don't know if God cares if we actually have savings or retirement. I think it's smart. I think it's wise in the culture we live in, but at the end of the day, I don't think he's going to be like, listen, you did good on earth. I mean, your IRA and 401k are looking on point. I think he's going to look at us and go, did you trust me or not? 
And as I walk away from the creation story, what I see is a God who took six days and then took a day and said, this is very good, and this is enough. God is a God of beginnings. Uh, if you want more on this, I, I found a really good teaching that I've been really fed by over the last couple of years. It's called, the, it's called Bema Discipleship, B-E-M-A, and the word discipleship. It's BemaDiscipleship.com. There's also a podcast, which is where I'd recommend you listen to it. And uh, this guy really tackles the idea of Eastern versus Western thinking. And really, if you want an assignment, listen to the first two episodes. It's a, it's a lot to get into. It's like 150-something episodes now. But listen to the first two. And it, it'll put, especially if you grew up in church in America, it'll put a different spin on how you read Scripture because it'll help you understand there's more to the Bible than just wanting us to know a bunch of facts and figures. God wants us to know a treasure, a treat, a story. Um, and there were Adam and Eve, and they were in the garden. Okay, that's where we left them. And it was good. And it was a day of beginnings. And God said, I want you to build this world with me. And that was the beginning until another beginning came. When we get to chapter three, it takes an ugly turn. Now, most people are familiar with this story, even just from like hearsay, but we're gonna read it. In, in Genesis chapter three, starting in verse one, my, my Bible aptly subtitles it, The Fall, because it was rough. Genesis 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Anybody heard this story before? Have you ever noticed that there's a talking snake in this story? That is weird. Like, and outside of Harry Potter, okay, there shouldn't be talking snakes. Okay, so I want to take a step back. There's this phenomenon that happens with people. It's called the lullaby effect. And this is the lullaby effect. If you hear something enough times... No matter how weird it is, you're just like, that's normal. Snakes talk to people. Look, I'm outdoorsman. I'm going camping this evening. If I run to a snake and it talks to me, I'm going to chop its head off. (laughs) That's probably what they should have done that day. They didn't do it. Uh, So, you know, it's a, this is not a snake, guys. It it, it might look like a snake. This is something otherworldly. This is a demon, it's called the serpent. It might have looked like a snake. It might have, take, it might have actually taken the form of a snake and talked. I don't know. We don't have pictures. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure you could find pictures if you Google it, but that wasn't like Polaroid. That was like artist interpretation. Uh, it might be that it was just a creature that was serpent-like, and as they thought about it. Or it might have just been throughout the mythology of this telling of the story. I use that word in a different way other than like Greek and Roman mythology. Like as the, the mythos of this figure grew, they were like, let's just call it the serpent because serpents are scary. <laughs> I don't know. But this thing speaks up. A uh, spiritual being shows up. He's from another realm. And uh, a demon, perhaps Satan himself in, in some sort of f- physical form. Um, here's the thing I want us to know from the snake thing before we move on. There is so much more to the spiritual realm than we can ever know. It's there. It's so real. And I'm going to tell you honestly. All right, this is my confession. My name is Chris. I've been a pastor for 17 years. And I have no idea where demons come from. Okay. No clue. And you can show me all kinds of scriptures in the Bible that give me inferences of where they might have come from. And I get it. There's some clear. But here's what I have figured out, I I think, that God isn't really concerned about us knowing the details about how all of that works. Uh, What he wants us to know is they're dangerous. They're bad. They're out to get you. And they're not on his team. So it's real. And it gets dark here for a second. But that's real. And, And so I liken it maybe to a child who is told by his parent, don't run out into traffic to chase the ball and the kid doesn't need to know where the cars came from or where they're going they just need to trust that the parent knows what they're talking about and so this is what happens with the spiritual realm um and so some more of that's going to come out in the more of this series as we get through it because it's all over the bible but this is what happens okay verse two let's get back to the story the woman said to the serpent so the serpent said did god really say you can't eat from this tree and so this she answers the talking snake because i guess that's fine with her we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. (laughs) You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Take a step back. God had made a simple rule If you're a parent, you know this concept. You had one rule, right? He'd made a simple rule. It was don't eat fruit from this tree. Um, 
up to this point, God had been the creator of everything. And this is an interesting point that I found in some of the reading I've done in the last couple of weeks. This is interesting. Up until this point, it had been God's prerogative to decide what was good and what should be done up to this point. But he leaves an opportunity because he wanted a, creature, a cr- creation that wasn't a robot. It wasn't an automaton. Is that the right word? It, it, was, it had its own mind. And, and it could think on its own. So he left this opportunity for that creation to choose. To say, do you want to trust me to decide what's good and evil? Or do you want to know what it means to be good and evil? Uh, God uses a simple fruit as a gateway to decide. And maybe you've experienced that in your life, and for you, it was the gateway of, a, of your first time staying at home alone as a kid. And that was the gateway. Everything's been provided for you. It's been good. But now you get the chance to decide good and evil. Or any of the, you know, whatever happened for you. And if you've seen your kids be exposed to evil for the first time. For me, I was watching a movie. Uh, my son was probably three. And I wasn't paying attention, as dads do. It was probably rated R. And this dude just got brutally killed on TV. And it was a movie. It was fine. I didn't know my son. I looked up from his cars and was watching it and just began to bawl. And I will never forget, that was the day that my son first experienced that level of evil. It was not real. We were actors. But, you know, like there's this gateway moment for all of us, and for them it was a fruit. Verse 6 says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, doesn't that happen a lot? Mm. I like this taste of freedom. And also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took it and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Beginnings. Not all beginnings are beautiful. I can think of many times when I've tried something for the first time, and it was a terrible experience. I was like four years old. My grandma was eating a, a barbecue sandwich, like pulled pork, and she was putting um, Tabasco sauce on it. And I was like, Grandma, I can have the Tabasco sauce. Grandma, I want some. It looks good. Grandma, it's like ketchup. I want some. She was like, no, baby, it'll hurt. It's hot. You don't want that. No, no. Please, please. I want it. Please. I want Tabasco sauce. Please, please. No, no. Please, please. Okay. So she took that bottle, and she said, put your tongue out, and she dripped... <laughs> I love my grandma. Everything you need to know about parenting, you're going to learn in this moment. She dripped Tabasco sauce directly onto my tongue. All right. And I remember immediately regretting. And I crawling up on the sink in the bathroom and just pouring cold water in my mouth. And I was crying. And she was sitting there eating a sandwich like, you know, told you. Uh, thanks, grandma. Got what I asked for. Uh, Adam and Eve had the opportunity. They chose for themselves. They immediately regretted it. Adam and Eve um, take hold of this knowledge of good and evil. And what's interesting, you see what happened? What's the first thing they noticed? They were like, ooh, we're naked. And, you know, I'm super immature, so that makes me want to giggle. So, but I'm also like, I'm also like, wow, what a moment. Because we've all seen children who are completely unashamed. But then how many of us would just be like, you know what, I'm going town town today. Clothes, optional. You know, we don't know. We have this sense of propriety and, and modesty. And, and it's, I don't want to get into all of why was this the first thing that they noticed, but they had to go make clothes for themselves. And then God comes up later and says, hey, where are you guys at? Why are you wearing clothes? He knew. But this thing happened to them. They made the choice and they had the knowledge of good and evil. And they suddenly had this realization that I am exposed before God. I've made this choice and I have taken on a burden that I cannot bear. I now know evil. And evil for them was simple disobedience. But God is a God of beginnings and life. Though Adam and Eve immediately regretted this choice and there were consequences for the regret, uh, they were kicked out of the garden. Uh, Their son murdered their other son. That couldn't have been fun. Uh, For generations, it got worse. And they lived for a really long time. So what they watched was their offspring just become degenerate, terrible, not turning to their God, completely ignoring him. You can read through the story of Genesis and watch how that happens. But God, though they immediately felt regret, God immediately sought solution. And we see it, and it's tucked away in here in Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 14. And this conversation happens, and you might not pick up on it on the first time, but it's one of the most beautiful things. Verse 14 says this, uh, 
So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust all the days of your life. And then God says this thing, verse 15, don't miss this. And I will put enmity, like a struggle, like a, like a, like a distance, like a fight. I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And he and the offspring of the woman, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Here's the thing. God had a plan to crush evil. And uh, for generations, as the original readers read this, I, many probably skimmed through that and thought, well, that was very poetic. I don't know what that meant. But as time went by and more and more revelation from God became about what God's plan was to put the world back together, people began to look at this and say, that seems like a clue. That seems like a hint that God has a plan for a new beginning. That there's going to be a moment when somebody among us is going to rise up and just crush the head of evil. And in Genesis chapter 12, fast forward, flip over there. We see God take the first very clear step to make that happen. Now, a lot has happened. It's been 21 generations since Adam and Eve. Uh, God has destroyed the world in a flood. That's another fun story for another day. Read that. That's good stuff. And then uh, he actually, uh, he, 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 he watches the people as they continue to turn away from him. And he finds this nomadic herdsman shepherd guy named Abram. You will also know him as Abraham, same guy. Abram didn't worship God. But he was, like the rest of us, created in the image of God. And so he had a spark within him of God's likeness. And so for whatever reason, God looked down. He saw this guy, Abram. And, and what I believe he saw in him was some godly traits. Among them, chiefly, the trait of hospitality. That's the first thing we see Abraham do. He's just friendly. He welcomes people into his house. And it's like, I'm just willing to do this. No matter what your background is, you can come to my house. And, and love. And then the biggest thing we see in him is faith. And that's, again, a, another study about Abram. We, we've, we've done that before, and, and you could go check it out on our podcast. But you got this guy, Abram, and God looks, and he says, I see in him the spark of God's character. I'm going to use him. So he shows up to Abram, and he speaks to him. Now, we had a, a talking snake uh, earlier. And, and uh, you know, if I actually saw the snake talking, I might be like, this is weird, but okay, I'm seeing where it's coming from. Abram starts to just hear God, just but apparently it was so manifest for him, so tangible, he immediately believed on God. And this is what happens in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Abram, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you, Abram. So... Abram went, as the Lord had told him, took Lot with him. That was his nephew. And Abram was 75 years old, and that's a major part of the story. As you read through it, he was an old fellow. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and they set out for the land of Canaan. They, here's the deal. They had, he was wealthy. He was a very wealthy guy. And he hears from God, and God says, listen, I got a plan. And Abram legitimately was like, I don't know what that means, but I believe you. His own friends and family were like, Abram, what are you doing, man? Why are you packing up and leaving? You got it made in the shade here. Abram wasn't a God worshiper. But when he experienced God, everything changed, and God began to use him. God was not done with his treasured creation. And he begins to unfold this, this plan of the crushing of the head of evil through Abram's family. Uh, Abram, I want to partner with you to put the world back together. Abram said, I'm willing to give it a go. The rest of the story of the Old Testament is the story of Abram's family. And what a story it is. What is the blessing? Well, the blessing that God had promised Abram has come to pass now, and this is what it is. Eventually, Abram's offspring would become the nation of Israel. And from that nation, God would choose a family line, namely the line of a king named David, and from that family line, eventually, a couple hundred years later, a girl named Mary would be born. And that little girl, that young woman, would allow God to cause her to become miraculously pregnant. And from that bizarre turn of events, God would come into the world as a human child named Jesus. And out of the brokenness of the beginning, 
God creates an opportunity for new beginnings over and over and over. And that's where we pick up next week. Next week, we're talking about the journey. How did we get there? How did we find Jesus? But as we wrap up, here's the thing. God is a God of beginnings. And maybe that's what you need to hear today. That no matter what brokenness, no matter what gateway of, 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 of evil you were introduced to or fruit you've eaten or whatever, that God has got a plan for you to be re- reunited with him and restored and, and have an opportunity to commune with him, live with him, talk with him, uh, have family like this who can back you up. And the story's in here. Today, after we finish this, we're gonna head over to this pool and we're gonna, we're gonna baptize Emery. So you're gonna start a new walk with Jesus today. Maybe that's what you need today. Maybe you've been coming to church for a while, but you're like, I, I've never really made this like an official decision. I wanna let you know, it is an official decision. Like, it's not like you just kinda, if you go to church long enough, you get like grandfathered in. Um, God is very serious about you verbally stating your faith in him. And in the New Testament, as we see the church being formed, every single new believer decides because of uh, obedience to get baptized in the name of Jesus. And in that moment, we're promised that we will be given his Holy Spirit to guide us, we'll be given the forgiveness of our sins. And as we're over the pool today, if you want that in your life, there's no preamble to it. You say, I want that for my life. Maybe there's a prayer, maybe there's some questions you have, and you can go home in wet clothes today, but you can go home with a new beginning. So maybe that's you. Maybe you want to talk about it over the next several weeks. I want you to know that God's love for us gives us the chance at new beginnings. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone. The brokenness is wiped away. The mistakes and the fruit that you have eaten have been forgotten about by God. The old is gone. The new is here. And it's said that God's mercies are new every morning. Have you backslid? Have you messed up? Guess what? God is, God is more concerned with repentance than he is with a perfect attendance record. He wants us to continue to turn back to him, turn back to him, turn back to him. So maybe that's just what you need today. I just need to turn back. It's been, it's been too long. And you know where we find all this information? In the Bible. It's, it's a guide for us Psalm 119, 105 says that your word is a lamp for my feet, a light to my path. We live in a world of darkness. And isn't it great to have something light the way? So let's open the Bible and see the God of beginnings. Let's pray.